testing. There we go. And we got loud and clear volume. All right. Let's go back and sing that song again. Praise God. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you lay down your life. That I might be set free. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Let's sing it again. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my Just that right there real quick praise God praise the Lord we're gonna sing another song here real quick let's see what is the name of that song that um, that really spoke to us that we love we're singing there for a while um, by, uh, 
Yeah, is that the name of it? The goodness of God. The goodness of God. Where is it at? I know I have it. Praise God. Do y'all remember the name of that song? We sang it quite a bit. Goodness of God. Let's see. There we go. That's the one. That's the one. So let's adjust this a little bit. Praise God. All right, let's sing this song together. Amen. There we go. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head And I will sing Of the goodness of God and All my life you have been All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God Sing that again, all my life and All my life you have been All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after
how the goodness of God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is so good. Amen. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study tonight out of uh, Philippians. Let's see. Can you take this and put that in the... Praise the Lord. We'll be looking at a Philippians tonight. And um, as we're preparing and, and thinking about Philippians, Philippians is a... Um, it is a message, it's a challenge about how we uh, go about living our lives when we're going through difficult times, when we're going through challenges, when we're going through hardships. And um, praise God, you know, it's a beautiful message of how Paul Paul deals with these hardships. He deals with these circumstances and he lives by faith. He lives firmly by faith. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Now give me a second here. I'm going to pull up the passage of scripture and share it on the screen for everyone. Let's see here. There we go. Praise God. Let me see where I put that at now. Here we go. I have to organize things a little bit and make sure I get it uh, just, uh, just right. Praise the Lord. Let's see, where is the scripture at? Where did it go? You all bear with me for a moment. Running a little behind here tonight, trying to get everything ready. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. This is Jerry. Y'all can y'all can should be able to see her there. <laughs> We see um, Sister Grace is greeting us. Good evening. So good evening, Sister Grace. Yeah. Good evening, Sister Grace. And uh, everybody else joining yeah. us. Good evening, Pastor Lai and um, Brother Well. Praise God. All right. Give me a second here. Here we go. Here we go. Adjust this camera a little bit. Praise the Lord. So we're looking at if he, uh, excuse me, we're looking at Philippians chapter 1, uh, 12 through 26. Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 26. And it starts off, and Paul says this, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It's true that some preach the gospel of Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motive or true, Christ is preached. Hallelujah. I love that. No matter what, Christ is is preached. Paul goes on and he says this, the important thing is that whatever, uh, that in every way, whether false over Christ is preached. And because of this, he says, I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. I will continue to rejoice 
For I know that through your prayers, God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So I eagerly expect and hope that I'll in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my... Let me see here. Someone's joining. There we go. So that Christ will be... Uh, exalted. I have sufficient courage to always know that Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to live is, to, is in Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. We've got echoing going on here. There we go. Almost in, there you go, brother. All right. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. Uh, I was reading a story by Charles Swindoll, and he was talking about his mentor while he was a student in college, Bruce Waltke, uh, at Dallas Seminary. He tells this story about how that one day him and his daughter were walking in the forest, and they came upon something that you rarely see. It was an almost-born butterfly. The little cocoon was spinning and spinning, and part of one fabulous wing was already out. And it was right at eye level, um, Bruce Walke records, and his daughter bent down, looked at the little cocoon at her level, and she said, oh, daddy, it is struggling to get out. And so Bruce thought, okay, I'll just help it. So he said he reached down ever so carefully, he gently took off the bottom of that cocoon and he split it open. And out of it dropped this blob and it killed the butterfly. And he said he learned an important lesson that day. The struggle of emergence and to survive. You see, for a butterfly, part of its learning to live is struggling to break free from the cocoon it's in. And in the process of pumping and working and trying to break free, those wings are filled with fluid to open up so that it can fly. And that's a beautiful message, I think, for all of us, is that part of the struggle we're in is exercising spiritual muscles. It's exercising um, attitudes, spiritual attitudes, it's, ac it's exercising emotional, um, um, emotional fortitude, emotional maturity that only comes through the struggle. And if we try to bypass the struggle, we're missing out on an incredible opportunity for growth. Paul writes, in a way, in this passage, that is very thoughtful and encouraging concerning the struggles that we all face. Paul, the struggle was now being under arrest and, and being in prison. And Paul's not depressed by no means. In fact, he speaks about the situation thankfully because Christ is being preached. These verses are still very much uh, in the opening introduction of Paul's letter to the Philippians. And if you remember uh, from last week in our study, many theologians have pointed out that this is considered a friendly letter. It's different than a lot of the other letters that Paul writes. And so Paul, he's addressing the concern that probably some of the Philippians have with their beloved mentor, their beloved uh, evangelist and teacher and and spiritual leader being in prison. And, and Paul, he writes this friendly letter to the Philippians, and we can see two dilemmas being faced here. In true style, 
for both of these problems, Paul declares what looks like major difficulty. And he says, you know what? It's being turned around for an opportunity for the gospel. I think that's beautiful when you think about it. Because when you're facing a struggle, I think it should challenge you to say, what is the opportunity that's hidden in this for the gospel? What is the opportunity? You see, first of all, Paul's in prison, and, and that really is an issue, right? No matter what age you live in, being in prison. But Paul sees a silver lining in this situation, in this condition. Paul is a traveling apostle, and you know, to be put in prison would seem like to stop Paul dead in his tracks, but it doesn't. In fact, it opens up some opportunities for Paul, and we're going to talk about those in a moment. The second issue that we see here, which is very much related with Paul being in prison, is that some are trying to use this occasion of Paul's downfall as a way to speak against Paul. They're trying to use Paul's situation as a way to speak about Christ and the trouble that Paul is in for even speaking about Christ. N.T. Wright, he points out, he says that they don't believe the message. They merely want to make more trouble for him while he's in prison. And we know, in fact, in um, the book of Acts, there were a group of rubble riser, rousers that were chasing after Paul all along the way, trying to uh, convince uh, everyone that, hey, this is this guy. You got to put him in prison. He's causing trouble everywhere he goes. And Paul, he's talking about these two issues. Now, this is where Paul is. But he has this unwavering belief that God is working through even unlikely, unlikely circumstances. He has an unwavering belief, even though the unlikely circumstances, God is working through them. And Paul, he's ready to give an answer. He's ready to point out that God is still at work even when we don't understand the circumstances. Interestingly, Paul, because he was in prison, he had, um, this was an opportunity for him. In fact, we know that because when Paul was in prison, he offered up four letters of encouragement to the churches. And, you know, there, this opportunity of being in prison spoke to so many of those early believers, as well as saints throughout all of the ages, even to the present day, of being in prison and still serving the Lord, still serving Christ. And so Paul, he's using this as an occasion. He's using this as an opportunity to speak out. So we know that he wrote Ephesians while he was in prison. Of course, the letter of Philippians, because it, it talks about it. He wrote Colossians while he was in prison, and Philemon. The struggle that Paul faced and found in prison uniquely equipped him to reach others and the difficulty of their situation. Now, I want to pause there because I think you really have to think about the hardships and the struggles that you may be facing and what is it about your situation, what is it about your condition that is uniquely equipping you to minister to those around you. Now, all of these apostles, they faced hardships and suffering. Um, every single one of them was either tortured or put to death for the sake of the gospel. But their willingness, their willingness to lay their lives on the line, it deeply impacted other believers, and it encouraged them all the more to speak the truth of the gospel. Praise God. It impacted them to speak the truth of the gospel. And so when we examine the first part of this passage tonight, we see this wonderful engagement and encouragement that's being revealed. Look at verses 12 through 14 again, just for a moment. 12 through 14. I'm going to see if I can highlight it for everyone as well. Where did that pat the scripture go? There we go. Let me highlight it for everyone. 
Notice what it's saying here. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, my daughter is behind me and she's sharpening a pencil. So we're going to wait for a second here as she, she finishes, finishes. I don't know if you all can hear it. If you, you can hear it, you probably uh, can chime in and go, yeah, we hear it. <laughs> Listen to what Paul says here. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, and they dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, Paul, he's, in, he's declaring two important things here. Early on, when the gospel was being shared, many did not know who Jesus was. And Paul was completely about this. He was about telling everyone who Jesus Christ was and who Jesus Christ is. So think about what this passage is saying. Here we have palace guards. And Paul says, not only they, but everyone is hearing the message of who Christ is. Paul says everyone around is hearing about Christ. It may not have been the way that Paul would have liked to get the biggest audience and the message of Christ, but because of his chains, because of his situation, a lot of people knew. Now, I want to put this in perspective for you a little bit more. One theologian, he said this, Every major center of Roman influence, it had this imperial guard. As was the case in Ephesus, where Paul was likely imprisoned. The soldiers were used, uh, they were used to a gospel. Praise God. They were used to a gospel about Caesar. Think about that. They were used to the message, the truth of Caesar. The supposed good news that the new emperor had taken the throne, bringing, so he claimed, peace and justice to the world. The palace guard, they were used to that message. And now someone is announcing, someone is proclaiming a different gospel. That Jesus of Nazareth has taken the throne of the world and was summoning every person to bow at his knee. Now, you have to think about it from their perspective. There's one emperor. Who is this Jesus that you're proclaiming? I thought he was crucified. And Paul, he is ecstatic. Because why? Because even the palace guard are hearing the message of a new king of all the earth, King Jesus. You see, his circumstances have not caused uh, uh, the name of Jesus. His circumstances have caused the name of Jesus to be more widely known than he ever first thought. This, this takes a real healthy perspective here. I'm saying this because it takes healthy perspective for, for me and you to see things like Paul sees them. I mean, think about it for a moment. What would be your first response? When you face an incredible, difficult situation, what would be your thoughts? What would be the attitude toward the event? And, and even the behavior that you would portray to others? I really think this is a good time to pause and reflect on some questions that are related to how Paul dealt with this. Think about it. I want to ask you this question. What situations have you recently found yourself in that could have been an opportunity to see God's silver lining? What situations have you recently found yourself in that could have been an opportunity to see God's silver lining of the situation? That means that you've been in a situation and maybe you haven't looked at it the same way that Paul looked at his situation being in chains. Think about this question. Excuse me. What are some of the emotional responses that you might struggle with? 
what emotional responses you might struggle containing that could benefit from looking for God's hidden purpose in, in this issue. How, how do you react when everything falls apart? What, what might you look at differently to say, you know what, God has something there that I haven't thought about before. Here's another question. What are some of your interpersonal relationships that you have where Christ could either be shared or could be in you standing for what is right? What are some of those interpersonal relationships that you could share Christ or stand for what is right? Maybe it's uh, you're put in a situation, an ethical situation, and you're saying you're tempted to give in and, and not do what's right because of how hard the situation is, right? When we reflect on questions like these, my, my prayer is that, you know, the Holy Spirit does the deep work in us. And it's in these times of reflection that we, we repent and we say, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me to exemplify you. Lord, help me to see the incredible opportunities around me. And Lord, give me strength. God, give me strength and wisdom as we try to live holy lives. In Romans chapter 8, 28, verse 28, Paul, um, he's commending the church in Rome, and he's, he's really commending them to consider difficult situations. And not only just say, yeah, yeah, we got a difficult situation, but he's asking them, look to God for the purpose of, of the situation. Now, this is what he says in Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called, in, been called according to his purpose. So that means that when you're in a difficult situation, you're asking yourself, God, what is it in this situation that you have, you're putting, you've put me in, you allowed me to be here, to work through for your glory. What is it right now, God, that's working for your good? What is it right now that's working for my good? God, am I, am I that butterfly right now who is flexing those wings, learning new spiritual muscles that can only come through a difficult situation? Now, I want to go ahead and progress here a little bit and look at the next section these are verses 15 through 18. 15 through 18. It reads, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. Not sincerely, he says, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But notice what Paul says in verse 18. But what does it matter? What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Hallelujah. That's such a wonderful take on this situation. You know, I couldn't imagine being thrown in jail. All my life, I've been taught, don't go to jail. you got to stay out of jail. Do what's right. But here is a man who did what was right and was thrown in prison. And I couldn't imagine the naysayers. Did you hear about Pastor Mike? He got thrown in jail. That's not true. Right, but I, no, I, know, I was never thrown in jail. I'm, I'm mimicking, right? Praise God. I'm mimicking what some might say. Did you hear about so-and-so? They got thrown in jail. Can you imagine what that would feel like? And Paul, he's saying something. What does it matter? I'm here because of the Lord. I'm here because of Him. Now, verse 15 and 17, they in indicate 
something that, you know, honestly, it makes most pastors cringe because we want to see the gospel of Christ properly presented. And Paul says, it's true, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Verse, if you skip down to verse 17, it says, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. Some theologians have suggested that these people were rival Christian groups. I've certainly encountered people... Uh, in my time of ministry, who've, who've honestly, they preached in a hateful manner. I've, de- I've ran into folks like that. But other theologians suggest, and I, I think, too, this seems more likely, that these were ordinary pagans who were talking up the latest piece of news. The other day, I'm driving past Capitol Hill, in fact, I've seen this gentleman every day now for since we came back on island. He's out there with a sign, and he is talking about something. He's trying to get attention about something. And honestly, I can't read the sign because the letters are, are so dimly written. But when we see things like that, it reminds me because we're all like, did you see that guy? What's he doing? What is going on? And yet, there, there is really a genuine purpose for why he is walking back and forth every day in front of uh, the government businesses. He's trying to get a message out for those who are coming in. We've all been around the gossipers, the ones who always have something interesting, some interesting piece of news to share. I used to, uh, at our church, at other churches, I've, I've ran into people um, who use the prayer report, uh, uh, prayer request as a time of, uh, of talking. <laughs> oh, did you hear about this? We need to pray about this. And they use that as a time to. And I've often kind of chuckled because there's always that tendency for everyone to want to talk negatively, to want to get involved and say something bad. In the workplace, we call it the water cooler conversations because this is where people gather at the water cooler and while they're there, they're talking about the latest piece of hot news. One theologian, he's pointing out this situation about ordinary pagans and you can hear that dialogue. You can hear that dialogue that's kind of reminiscent about what I mentioned. He wrote this and I liked his way of saying it. He said this, have you heard? They'd said to each other. They've caught that strange fellow, Paul, who's been going around saying there's a new king, a new emperor. And you won't believe it. This new king turns out to be a Jew they crucified a few years ago. And this jailbird is saying he's alive and that he's the real Lord of the world. What a dangerous lunatic this Paul character is. Now, That was probably, and most sincerely, what was actually being said about Paul. But notice Paul's response to all of this. Verse 18, what does it matter? The important thing Paul is saying, in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. We've already seen in the gospel, we've already seen that the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached to the world was, was still very much in its infancy. And Paul, he's ecstatic because the word of God is being preached. He's ecstatic because he's getting free publication about Jesus Christ. The name of Christ is being put out there for all to hear. And he understands something. He understands that when they hear the name of Christ, they're going to be, begin to ask questions. And it's the opportunity. And I love this, this level of peace that Paul has in letting God fight his battles. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes, and we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, Paul writes about wrapping ourselves up in the Word of God. And He's doing this so not to fall prey to the devil's schemes. 
This is a prime opportunity where Paul could have fallen prey to the devil's schemes. He could have fallen prey and, and said, you know, these people attacking me. He didn't fall prey to it. He didn't attack flesh and blood. Remember, look, at, look again what Ephesians 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 10 says. Finally, be strong in the Lord in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And then he says this powerful piece of truth. For our struggle is not with flesh and blood. Our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces in heavenly realms. Just like it says in verse 18 of Philippians 1. What does it matter? Christ, though, is preached. Paul has internalized this deep spiritual truth, and he's saying, what does it matter? We know that in letting it matter, you see, when you let it matter in your life, it burns up a whole lot of mental energy. It steals your joy. It, it steals your sleep. Uh, Psalms chapter 127, verse 2 tells us that God grants sleep to those he loves. Why let the devil steal your rest? Why let the devil steal your joy? You see, the Lord, He is our joy. He's our refuge. Take refuge in Him. Take rest in Him. Paul's saying, why does it matter? What does it matter? I know who has redeemed me. I know who has saved me. I don't care what the world may say. Several years back, a, a good uh, minister friend of mine in Kentucky, he was talking about how his son and daughter was attacked by someone on the outside of their church. His son and daughter were pastors of this church and they were, lies were being told about them. And, and the daughter was saying, you know, I just don't know, dad. I'm just, this is just hurting us. We got to find some way to uh, rebuild my husband's reputation because these are lies. And I remember my, this brother, he said, he said to his daughter, he says, what does it matter? Trust in Christ. Allow Christ to have the last word. Allow Christ to have the last word. You see, because everyone who attacks is going to stand judgment before God. And we just allow God to be the one to handle the situation. Now, I've reflected on this passage over the years, and it's, it's been something that I've honestly had to learn and relearn. And I think, honestly, for a lot of believers, we're in that same place because it hurts. It hurts when you feel attacked. It hurts when you feel that someone's coming against you, especially against your faith. And Paul's saying, what does it matter? Just, just give it to the Lord. Trust in Him. See, you really can't dwell on the naysayers. You can't. Can't do it. You have to focus, instead of the naysayer, you have to focus on the Prince of Peace. You have to focus on the one that leads you to the truth. You have to focus on the one who loves you more and is closer than a brother. That's what you have to focus on. Um, I really like what N.T. Wright says here about Paul's ability to adapt and encourage in spite of crazy difficulty. Because I'm telling you, being in prison, being tortured, that's crazy difficult. And Paul, he adapted and he's encouraging people. Listen to what N.T. Wright said. Paul writes to encourage the church in Philippi. But his words ought also to be great encouragement to us. How often are we tempted to feel discouraged because our plans were badly thwarted or because malicious people were trying to make life difficult? We need to learn from Paul, N.T. Wright says. We need to learn from Paul the art of seeing God's purposes worked out through problems and difficulties. That makes me say, ouch, praise the Lord and oh me all at the same time. Because we don't like, we don't like difficulties, but being able to see God's purposes worked out through problems and difficulties, that is perspective. That's perspective that goes beyond the way that we would like to see things handled. Now, I want to look at the last part of this passage tonight. This is 19 through 26. 19 through 26. Paul says, 
Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. This is a great, great uh, place to stop right here. When you're in difficulty, when you're in a hardship, turn your sadness to joy. Begin to shout a hallelujah. There's a song that was out, not, I, I, I think it was this last year. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Raise a hallelujah. Raise a, a, a sound of rejoicing. You know, you're going to find Paul repeatedly throughout the letters to the different churches. He encourages. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Because if we focus on rejoicing in God, it turns our eyes off the difficulties and we're able to look up and see our master and creator. Verse 19 says, for, though, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. That's hope. Verse 20 says, so I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But it's, it is more necessary for you, Paul says, than I remain in the body. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and your joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Those are beautiful words when you think about it. Those are beautiful words because Paul, he has clearly not lost his hope. He's clearly not lost his hope. But he sees things in a genuine and clear manner that demonstrates where Paul's hope is really found. Praise God. Now, as a child, I remember singing a hymn by this... Um, this author, his name was Edward Mote, and he wrote this hymn. He said, my hope is built on nothing less. Now the hymn, it was written way, way, way back in 1834. But I want you to listen to these timeless words. And I'm going to sing some of it because I, like, I think it makes more sense to sing these than, than anything. If you know the words, just sing along with me. He says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I'm gonna, I want you to listen to verses 2 and 4 here. Verse 2 says, in every rough and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. He shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Amen. My hope is built. Amen. Your hope is built. It should be built on Christ. We, we, we have not lost the hope. We have not lost the hope. Because just, just like Paul, Paul's keen and intent purpose was to spread the good news of Christ. That's our hope. That's, we're called to do that. This is our purpose. We're called to share the good news 
of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're called and Christ has given us a firm hope. When everything is down and out, everything is hard and difficult, we can learn to lean on Christ, just like Paul. Now, in verses 20 through 24, Paul writes something that I think should as well encourage all of us. He says in verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted. Amen. In my body, whether by life or by death, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between these two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better, far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul, he says here, he would rather, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, he would be better off dead. And this is not... This is not a death wish in the sense of someone losing self-esteem or becoming terminally depressed or longing to get out of this life as quick as possible. That's far, far from the truth. Paul is absolutely full of energy, and he's quite ready to get back to work as soon as they let him out of prison. But you see, here's the thing. Paul is a man who's in love with the Messiah. He longs to be with his master. Paul's already died to self. That means... Everything in this life doesn't matter anymore to Paul. Only one thing matters. That's Christ. The message of Christ. And so for Paul, he's ready to be with the Lord. He has a glory ache in his heart. He has a glory ache. He wants to be with whom he loves. And nothing in this world possesses him except Christ. On Monday... I spoke in chapel, and I shared about a young teenager. Her name was Cassie Bernal. Cassie was shot and killed in the Columbine shooting, uh, Columbine High School, back in April 20, 1999. Her shooter found her. He pointed a pistol at her head, and he asked her these faithful words, this, this faithful question. He said to her, point blank, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And she said, yes, as if, why not? Why not believe? It was, it was instantaneous for her. Yes, I believe in Jesus. And the shooter looked at her and said, why? And he shot her. Now, on the night before her death, Cassie had recorded in her journal, and her brother Chris had found her journal. That uh, Actually, it was the, the Sunday before she wrote it in her journal. And she, he found it, and I want you to listen to what Cassie wrote the Sunday before all of this happened. She said this, Now, I've given up on everything else. I found it to be the only way to know Christ and to experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again and to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. So whatever it takes, she wrote, I will be the one who lives in the fresh and newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. Cassie, of course, is speaking a paraphrase of a passage that Paul wrote. She understands that, just like Paul, that nothing in this world, she's died to herself, she is centered wholly and completely in Christ. Cassie died to herself with the firm understanding that she was already alive in Christ. I mean, this makes so much sense why Paul is so excited. He's like, even the palace guards are talking about Jesus. Because Paul, his hope, his, 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 his enjoyment in life was founded, was seated, was alive in Christ. Now, N.T. Wright, he writes this. I want to share this. The central thing about dying is that it will mean going to be with Jesus his Lord, Master, and King. This language is perhaps the best and safest Christian 
way of talking about life after death. Since seldom in the New Testament do we find people talking about something like going to heaven when we die. For Paul, just as most Jews, and we'll see later in Philippians chapter 3, the resurrection is still to come. The dead will receive new bodies to live in a new world that God will make for them. Heaven is the place we go when we die, but it's not permanent. Because you see, that's not God's master plan. God's master plan is to have a new heaven and a new earth. Bringing that holy city of Jerusalem down to earth, this thousand year reign here on this planet where we rule and reign. And Paul, he's like, you know, I'm already ready for God just to get it on over with. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Bring it about, Lord. Make it happen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. God's good. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. I want to encourage everyone. Um, we're going to be continuing this study in, uh, in Philippians over the next... Uh, several weeks. And so uh, I want to encourage you, please continue to read along with us. Next week, we're going to be looking, uh, I believe, at verses 27 through the end of the chapter. Um, please read along with us and kind of prepare your hearts and minds for what we're going to be talking about. Praise God. We're going to transition here for a little bit, and we're going to spend some time praying. If you have prayer requests, uh, please post them in the chat. Uh, any prayer requests that you have. If uh, you have other requests and you happen to post these after the video is ended, we will be going back and reviewing uh, the different prayer requests and, and, and praying for these needs. So don't, don't lose heart if you happen to post later on. Uh, I'm going to pull up our Facebook Messenger group accounts and, and see if you have any prayer requests, please, please post them so we can join you in prayer as well. Hallelujah. Praise God. Those with us on Google Meet tonight, do you have any prayer requests? Praise God. Any prayer requests? Your friend? What's what's their name? Okay, pray for Tony. Pray for Tony. Tony is uh, a friend of my wife, and uh, he is sick with cancer, so we need to lift Tony up in prayer. Praise God. Uh, we have prayer requests from um, Grace Parco. Pray for healing of Beth de Acampo. Okay. Praise God. Any other prayer requests? Any other prayer requests tonight? Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right. Hallelujah. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. And we're also going to pray tonight. Ask for a time of reflection. Um, thank you, Brother Lowell. I see that prayer request. Prayers for expedition of papers. All papers. Yeah. I'm going to lift that up. We're also going to just spend some time reflecting tonight as well as we, as we enter this time of prayer. Thinking about God, how do we make this, how do we look for the, um, your purpose being completed in life? God, what is your purpose in difficult situations? And, and uh, learning to give that to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Father, we, we come to you tonight, and we just bless your holy name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you so much that you love us. And God, that you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that your Spirit is upon us and in us. And Lord, as we come together as a body, even though we're distant, Lord, we're coming together as one. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you would refresh our hearts and our minds. Lord, refresh our conviction, Lord, to give you control in every way. God, we pray in the name of Jesus, God, we pray. Lord, just take control in our lives. God, we, we give you our emotions. 
Lord, when, when we're stressed, we give it to you, Lord, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, just to reveal to us, speak to us in our hearts, prepare us, God, help us to stand firm and in faith. Lord, we pray. God, help us to begin to look, God, especially in those circumstances in our life that where things are difficult, God, where what is your purpose, God? Help us to begin to see, God, that you are working out a purpose that we couldn't even begin to imagine, Lord. We thank you, Lord. God, we lift up uh, Tony to you. We pray, God, for your touch upon Tony, your touch upon his body. Lord, touch him in the name of Jesus. Lord, bring healing. Lord, we thank you, God, because your word says that you are a great healer. You're a great physician. God, your word promises healing, Lord. Your word says, by your stripes we're made whole. God, we just pray for healing over Tony in the name of Jesus. Healing, God. Healing in his body. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift up Beth de Acampo. Lord, and we pray, God, for your healing touch on Beth. Lord, touch her body, Lord. Lord, touch her in the name of Jesus, God. Father, just one word, God, and... and Lord, your healing would come. And Lord, we speak your word in faith. We speak healing over Beth. We speak healing over Tony. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. God, we pray. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. By your stripes we are made whole. Lord, we lift up so many, Lord, in, in the body of Christ who are not doing well. Lord, maybe it's anxiety that has stricken their heart. Lord, we speak peace over them, or peace over their heart, or peace over their minds, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we lift up this prayer request, God, for the papers. Lord God, we pray, God, for favor, Lord God, with government leaders. Favor, God, for all of these situations, God. We give it to you in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord God, Lord, turn the hearts, God. Lord, make a way, Lord, where there seems to be no way, Father, for this, for those papers to be expedited, God, for answer to come in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we, as well, we ask God for peace. Lord, your peace, God. Lord, your peace that passes all understanding. Your peace that guards our hearts and minds. God, we, we give it to you right now. We give you the concerns. We give you the doubts. We give you the fears. We just, we give it to you, God, and we ask you to take control in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. God, we pray your, your peace over our church. God, we pray your Holy Spirit, God, would move in our church, Lord. God, we pray for people to be filled with your Spirit, Lord. Lord, for baptisms in the Holy Spirit to occur. God, for people, for signs and wonders. God, for healings, God. Oh, Lord God, Lord, have your way in our church. Lord, help us not to stand in the way of what you want to do, Lord. God, we just submit to you. God, have your way, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, my wife just reminded me, we also need to pray for Pastor Ray, Sister Elaine, especially for the family with, uh, uh, with the passing. Let, let's just pray again one more moment. Father, we lift up, Lord, the, the Kinsellas to you, the whole family. Lord, all of Sister Elaine's extended family, Lord God. Lord, we know there is deep hurt and sorrow, God, with the passing of a loved one. And God, we pray that you would use this, Father, for your glory. Lord, that folks would come to Christ. They would give their life to you, Lord. Lord, we pray for salvations. God, but we also pray right now for peace. Your peace, God. Your peace, Lord, that passes all understanding. Lord, just give a sense of rest, a sense of being able to breathe again for those who are so sorrowful. Lord, we pray. 
God, Lord, there may be morning in the night, but God, joy comes in the morning. God, restore your joy. Restore your peace. Lord, we pray. Bless them, God. Keep them safe. Keep Protect them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Hi. Hi. What are you eating? Is that a is that an ice cream cone? It's a lollipop. A lollipop. Oh, okay. <laughs> is he just like right across the room from you? <laughs> all right. God bless you all. God bless. Hey, thank you, Brother Lowell, for helping with chapel the other day. I apologize. I wasn't uh, able to be right there and assist with everything going on. But thank you so much.